things, all of the things of life. We've come here today to focus our hearts on the one, the only one. Thank you, Jesus. However you picture him on the cross, resurrected, feeding 5,000, however you picture him, picture him in your mind right now. I love you, Jesus. You're awesome. And I praise you. Now tell him. Tell him you love him. Be the center of my life. Hold my world together, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. By you, all things consist. Everything holds together because of you. You're the gravity at the center of my life, and my life revolves around you, Jesus. I love you. Let everything else fade away but you, Jesus. We've come to love you, to worship you, to be in your presence today, and we thank you that you're here. Amen. Amen and amen. If you love him, would you give him a wonderful, rousing applause? Come on, tell Jesus. We love you, Lord. We bless you in this place. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome you to chapel today. I hope you had a great Labor Day weekend and uh, enjoyed your time. Now we're on the sprint to fall break and a lot to do at ORU. Uh, several things happened. I was at a conference last week and um, uh, so it was a good week. We thank God uh, for all of that. And um, uh, while I was gone, it became um, uh, official. We have now had at Oral Roberts University 11 consecutive years of enrollment increase. Would you give God praise? <laughs> Last year in the fall semester, we had 106 nations in our student body. This fall semester, we have, at least right now, maybe more as we go through the, the next weeks with online, but right now we have 111 nations in the student body at ORU. <laughs> I want to say, as um, Lee and Garrett shared earlier, our hearts go out to our friends in the Bahamas. We have 10 or 11 uh, students here from Bahamas. Where are you guys at? You're somewhere in the room. Raise your hand. There you go. Yeah. We're, we're praying for all of you. Some of you have family that were on Grand Bahama and Abaco, and our hearts are uh, going out to them. We are partnering with Convoy of Hope to help from here at the school. And so if you'd like to do something special, let us know, and we'll get it through to them uh, in the Bahamas. Also, a shout out this morning to Mingo Valley Christian School that is here up in this corner. Mingo Valley, welcome. Uh, two of my, uh, three of my grandkids go to this uh, school now. My son-in-law works there, and my daughter's in the house today as one of the guidance counselors for this school. Would you give them another hand? We want you all to be ORU students someday. 
Well, we're starting a new series in chapel today, and it is a um, series that uh, I've called Authentic. Every year during the summer, I uh, get away for uh, a few days, uh, especially toward the end of the summer before the semester starts, and just really focus my heart in asking God what He wants us to talk about this year in chapel, and uh, what are some of the things that He's called us to do. And um, uh, this year, I felt very drawn to this subject, and so for the next uh, this chapel and three other chapels, I'll be talking about a theme, authentic, authentic. I believe there's a deep longing in this generation for that which is authentic. We're tired of the smoke and mirrors of our society, and we just want the fluff to go away and have the real thing. One thing we do know is that Gen Z seems to value sincerity and authenticity, in fact, data reported by CNBC News uh, shows that authenticity is an important, one of the most important values for Gen Z. 67% of those surveyed agreed that being true to their values and beliefs makes a person cool. Authentic. Authenticity. The word authentic means real, genuine, of undisputed origin, true, original, bona fide. I like that word real. I hear that from... Uh, young people all over the world. We want something that is real, something that is uh, pure, that is good, that is authentic. Well, we did a little video. We went around campus and we talked to some students about authentic Christianity. So would you welcome our students as they talk about what it means to be an authentic Christian? I think an authentic Christian is someone who's just filled with the love and the spirit of Christ, someone who isn't afraid to put others above them. Just honestly being vulnerable and showing the love of Christ. Someone who truly is awe-inspired by God to act like a, a Christian and a Christ follower because they fear God. I think it's just showing the Father's heart in an everyday walk and just, um, and just being His hands and feet. Knowing where you're at and being open with where you're at with people who are around you, but also with the Lord. They understand the greater picture and that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus is the one who is always going to strengthen them. I would say that the difference mainly between an authentic Christian and someone who's maybe not following Christ with their whole heart is just like having a routine of, of quiet times and being able to seek God every single day. It's okay to have aspirations of where you want to be, but like not trying to get there before you really are and just being real about that. You should just come to God as you are because the more you try to be perfect in your own way, it's not gonna work out for you. You just gotta give it all to God. He doesn't call us to be perfect Christians, but just to be real with where we are so that he can take us on the journey to the next step to be more like him. I feel like we really get caught up in social media and we feel like we really need to portray that Christian life where in reality, it's more Christian off camera. So yeah, just being honest with yourself and the Lord. Being honest with yourself, I like that last response. Well today, we're gonna to be talking about authentic purity. Now this is not an easy subject, so I need your prayers and your attention through this chapel. It's going to be quite word heavy, so if you don't like the Bible, you probably won't like this message. But how many of you like the Bible? Good, well, I think we're gonna do okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. And Psalm 51 and 10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Father, I ask you to bless this moment now today as I share your word. And I pray, Lord, that this room, in many ways, for the next few minutes, would become a, a giant washing machine, a place where you wash us with the washing of your word and cleanse our hearts and minds in the world we live. We live in a polluted, filthy, corrupted world, God, and we sure need your help if we're going to be pure. So I pray you do the miracle only you can do today as I share your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Well, today I want to talk about purity. How can we be authentic in our pursuit of purity? But as we get started in this message, I first want to look at a group of people that were very inauthentic and how Jesus addressed them. This is a group of people in the New Testament called Pharisees, Pharisees. 
It was a Jewish sect during the times of Jesus who practiced strict observance of the traditional and written law. They were known for their outward piety, but they had inward struggles going on. They tried to conform outwardly, but inside, um, it was a big problem for them. Jesus calls them over and over hypocrites. So one of the subtitles of this message is how not to be a hypocrite. Turn around and tell somebody sitting by you, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Now turn back around to the same person and say, if I am, would you tell me so? <laughs> careful, careful, careful. Luke 12 and 1, Jesus talking about this group of uh, Jewish leaders, the Pharisees. He says, meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so they were trampling one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, this word hypocrisy means acting the part, deceit or deceitful. A person who is an actor who is not really what he is portraying that he is to others. As I went through this message, it wasn't easy as I reflected and asked myself the question over and over again, am I a hypocrite? My answer was, I have been sometimes. I sure don't want to be. Posing and trying to be something you are not is hypocrisy. Pharisees, this religious sect, tried to keep the law from an outward means only. And Jesus was probably the toughest on this group of people that he was on anyone else uh, in his ministry. He literally laid them in the shade. He was tough on the Pharisees. And the reason is in Matthew 23 and 3, Jesus says, do not do what they do. Don't be a hypocrite like these folks, for they do not practice what they preach. Now, in Matthew 23, and you're going to see as I talk about it, it'll scroll on the screen just to give you a reference point. Jesus gives a long discourse about the Pharisees. In fact, uh, most scholars call this the seven woes of being a Pharisee, the seven woes of Phariseeism or fair, being Pharisaical. And the word row comes from a, a word that means wrath or sorrow. Jesus per, is pronouncing wrath and declaring sorrow for those who are hypocrites, who act the part that they really don't live out and don't practice what they preach. Now, he gives several woes in here, seven of them. Matthew 23, 13, he says, they keep people out of the kingdom and they won't go in themselves. The Pharisees were a no culture instead of a yes culture. God does not want the church of Jesus Christ to be a no culture. He wants us to be a yes culture. Somebody say amen. amen. The second woe was that they were aggressive to get people to believe like them, but when they got them to believe with them, they made them the child of hell. They taught them the wrong thing. Third woe, Jesus said, you are blind guides. The blind are leading the blind and you are the blind leaders. You have selective obedience, Jesus said, and he gives several occasions as he talks about how they would say one thing was holy, but the other was not. One oath should be kept, but the other was not. They were masters of evasion and excuses. In other words, when they wanted to sin, they made an excuse, they evaded God's command and made it all right. The next woe was that they emphasized minors over majors. In other words, they majored on minors. I don't know if you ever met anybody like this, but they major on little things and forget about big things. Jesus talks about tithing. He said, you tithe the littlest uh, seed and make sure a tenth of that goes to God, but you forget things like judgment and love and justice, and you don't realize that these are the big things. You should have tithed. Uh, he says, you, you shouldn't have stopped doing that, so keep tithing, but remember the big things. Then he said, you guys are like people that strain a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, there's a cartoon, I think, going up on the screen that sort of shows this picture. He said, now, now let me pause for a moment. Both gnats and camels were unclean animals to the Jews and to Pharisees. But he said, when you have a glass that has a little bug in it, you are overly careful to get the bug out. And then all the while you're eating a camel. And they're both unclean. 
What he was saying is, you give so much attention to such little, minute things, and you forget the big things of God about loving and caring and doing right and caring about people and having justice. And he said, you spend all of your time on little stuff instead of the big things. You strain a gnat out, but you swallow a camel. Oh, my. The next woe. He says, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside it's full of garbage. In other words, when you wash your dishes, spiritually, Pharisees, you only wash the outside of the dish. That'd be terrible at your house, wouldn't it? If, you know, you don't have a dishwasher or it's broke, and so all you do is wipe the outside of the dish, and the spaghetti from last week is still inside, and the cereal from yesterday is still in there, and tomorrow it's got curdled milk, and you just keep wiping the outside, And day after day, it gets worse and worse and worse. Jesus was saying that you keep cleaning the outside in your life, but inside you're full of garbage. Now, he also said in Matthew 15, important, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. They were so hung up on all of the rituals and all of the cleansing. And Jesus said, the truth is, what's coming out of your heart is what is defiling you. We get so hung up on just the outward things, and we forget that the reason for the outward things is what's going on on the inside. And if you clean up the inside, the outside will follow Somebody say amen. Another woe. Jesus said, woe to you. You're hypocrites. You're like a whitewashed tomb, a really pretty graveyard that's filled with dead men's bones. You wash, you paint the outside of the tomb. You make it look good to everybody, but inside it's simply death. And then finally, He says, woe to you because you're hypocrites. You have selective amnesia and you have learned to fake it. You are deceiving yourselves. You build and decorate tombs for the prophets from long ago. And you say, we would never have killed the prophets, but you're going to kill me and I'm a prophet like unto Moses. And you are hypocrites. You're only playing the part and you have woe. Turn around to that same person and say, don't be a hypocrite. A lot of woe to hypocrites. Don't be a Pharisee. Now, as we look at Scripture, especially in this area of purity, especially in our own personal lives of dealing with purity and impurity in a way that keeps us from being hypocritical. So God calls us to not be a hypocrite in the way we deal with our own sin and our own struggle. So today I want to talk about purity because this is probably one of the biggest areas in our life that it's difficult to be authentic in. We tend to put on the facade. We tend to paint the tomb over. We tend to make things good on the outside. But inside, we struggle many times in this area. So I believe as we look at Scripture that God calls us to make purity a priority in our life. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, bringing it, boiling it all down to the simplest, simplest things, would say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, when we have impurity in our heart and in our lives, it robs us of our vision, our clarity of understanding and seeing God. In fact, when when we have impurity going on in our lives, it robs us of our destiny and it robs us of our spiritual authority. There was a time in the church of Jesus Christ when we connected purity with power. We understood that if you were living right, it helped you have authority with God and gave you uh, a place in him that allowed you to have spiritual power. But in our day, in the 21st century many times, people live simply on their charisma, their talent, their giftedness, and we think giftedness equals power or authority with God. And so we forgive people because of all of their impurities because they're so gifted. In other words, if you can preach good enough, you can sort of live however you want to and the church still accepts you because you're such a great preacher. 
Now, there's a real problem with that in that Jesus condemns such hypocrisy. That when we preach and do not live what we preach, we are considered hypocrites before him. God wants us to pursue purity as a priority in our life, knowing that when our hearts are clean, we see Jesus clearly and we have spiritual authority in Christ. In other words, He wants us who carry the gospel, whether we're a preacher in the pulpit or a scientist in the lab speaking of Jesus. He wants our life to back up what we say. And he wants us to live more by character than charisma so that when God uses us, it's for the long term and people are changed forever by the authority and power of God. Come on, give God praise. (laughs) Purity must be a priority. Second, Purity is possible. Woo. Are you sure? Yeah. According to God's word and the veracity of it, purity is possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. Let's look at what 1 Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 17, the message version. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life. A life energetic and blazing with holiness. Interesting words. God said, I am holy, you be holy. You call out to God for help and he helps. He's a good father that way. But don't forget, he's also a responsible father and won't let you get by with sloppy living. Your life is a journey you must travel with a deep consciousness of God. Well, I like the message version. He's a responsible father. Wow. God commands and calls us to be holy as he is holy. This is absolutely impossible in the human condition without supernatural help from the outside. Duncan Campbell, the great evangelist for the Hebrides revival said, and I quote, this desire for the heart purity is a creation of the Holy Spirit at work in the human heart. In other words, when we want to be pure before God, it is God working in us to say, I want you to be pure, and then we desire it ourselves. Philip Yancey said, the proof of spiritual maturity, listen closely, is not how pure you are, but awareness of your impurity. That very awareness opens the door to grace. Now, there are two extremes when we talk about purity. One is legalism, and the other is license. And there's a lot going on in today's church in both areas, though I must admit the scale in the 21st century is a little more on license than it is on legalism. But it's still there. Legalism, what does that mean, Dr. Wilson? Well, we hear that term a lot. Well, that's just legalistic. Well, legalism means trying to do God's will from external sources only. In other words, you read God's word and it speaks to you and you try to conform to it and keep it. You're trying to keep the letter of the law. Now, the truth is, this is not a terrible thing except when you impose it on others because when you try to keep God's word in your own strength, you'll always fail, right? It's impossible. That's why the law was given, to show man that he could not do it by himself. So when you try to keep God's word from external uh, strength only and your own human strength, you'll always fail, which drives you to the cross of Jesus to say, I need help from heaven. I need supernatural help if I'm going to do this thing. So legalism is wrong. It always causes people to mask their sin. People who are legalistic try to do the outward things that everybody can see to hide the inward things they're doing and are going on in their lives they don't want anyone to see. In other words, they are an actor. They are a hypocrite. They are trying to be one way when on the inside they're really another way. Now license is another extreme. License says, just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. You're forgiven for all of it anyway, and don't worry about trying to live right. Well, that doesn't work. You know, God has not turned the grace of God into a license to sin. Paul says, God forbid. 
God's grace, in fact, teaches us to live holy and soberly in this present world. When God's grace is at work in our lives, we want to live for Jesus. We want our lives to conform to him, and we want to live right. So if you're with someone and they say, ah, it doesn't matter. Just go on and do whatever you want to do anyway, and we'll worship it away next week. You tell them, forget that. That kind of lifestyle leads to impurity that will destroy you. So what is the middle ground? The middle ground is that purity is possible, but it is only possible as a work of the supernatural grace of God. And so I am pointed toward the cross to find help for my human need and condition. When I say to God, I see how impure I am, how pure you are. I need help from heaven. I need supernatural help in order to do this. So purity must be a priority. Purity is possible, though not easy. And finally, as I'm talking today, purity requires power. Power. Where do we get this power to live pure? We are in a um, polluted, unclean world. Now, that's been true since Adam's fall. I mean, it was so bad at one point, God sent the flood and washed the whole thing. He, he did have a uh, uh, washing machine from heaven that washed the earth, 40 days and 40 nights of rain until Mount Everest was covered, and washed away sin. However, the eight people that lived carried sin with them to the other side of the flood. And the first thing Noah does is get drunk and expose himself, and his son, one of his sons dishonors the father, and the cycle of sin and the chain reaction of it start all over again on this planet. So just washing the world, if we could, just washing it with physical water won't won't cure sin. We need power beyond that. Where is the power that we need in order to live pure in this filthy, corrupted, nasty world that we're in? How do we keep our hearts, our minds, our lives pure in this world? We're surrounded by it every day. I mean, it bombards us day and night. Every kind of sensual, sexual, unclean, greedy message bombards our mind and our spirit. How do we stay pure in the middle of that? Well, I believe God gives us three sources of power that are critical for purity. Number one is the power of the cross or the blood. Listen to this verse, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. Very authentic verse and will lead us to authenticity. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The power of the cross and the blood. The power of the word. Psalm 119 and 9. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your Word. Scripture says that we are cleansed by the washing of the word. In other words, this is God's holy inside detergent. And as you bathe your mind in the word of God and your heart in the word of God, it will dock away the impurities and help you be pure before him. John Bunyan said, either sin will keep you from the word or the word will keep you from sin. Number three, the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The Spirit's first name is holy, and he works to make us pure and to become like Jesus. Now, purity is both a crisis, I believe, and an experience in our lives. We come to a place of full surrender to Jesus, and then we open ourselves to a process of where he purifies us over time. I meet students all the time wondering what God's will is for their life. What is it God's wanting to do? What what is the will of God for you? What, What is God's will for you? Right there in the blue shirt. What's God's will for you? Right there in the check red shirt. Cool headband around your head. What's God's will for you? Sorry to embarrass you, but that's all right. The cameras just went on you. Only a billion people saw you, but you're doing great. 
What's God's will for you? You know, this is a question that we ask all the time. Well, let me narrow it down. Now, I want to give you God's general will. So I can say this for the guy in the hat with the blue shirt on and the lady with the band around her head and everybody else in this building. I know God's will for you. Hey, are you kidding? Yeah, just come by the office and I'll tell you what, what God's will is for you. And it's not going to have anything to do with what you major in. It's not going to have anything to do with who you marry. All of those are part of God's will. I'm talking about the general, perfect, big will of God for you. You know what God's big will is for you? That you be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That you be made like Jesus. <laughs> so what is God trying to do for you and in you? He's trying to make you like Jesus. And Jesus was pure. Malachi chapter 3 verse 2, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Old illustration, but a good one. That in the old days when someone was refining silver, they would take uh, the silver along with the other metals that had attached to it and maybe even some of the rock and uh, impurities. They would put it in a cauldron and they would boil it. They would heat the cauldron so much that the silver and everything else in it would melt. And over time, the impurities in the silver would float to the top. And the refiner of silver would scrape off the impurities. He would turn up the heat some more to get more impurity out. And every time he turned up the heat, there would be impurities that would come to the top and he would scrape them off. What is, what is the Holy Spirit doing in your life? What is God doing in your life? He keeps turning up the heat. He keeps putting on the pressure to get the impurities out of your life so he can get rid of them and get them away. It is said of a refiner of silver in olden times that he knew the silver was pure when he could see the reflection of himself in the silver. What is Jesus after? He wants the reflection of himself in your life. He wants you to be pure and after him. So I'm going to close by giving you 10 practical steps. This is a sermon about authenticity. I want to give you simple, very simple things. Write these down if you want to. First three, I hope you can remember if you don't write down. Number one, how do I stay pure? What are some practical steps for purity in the 21st century? Number one, shun. Proverbs, do not be wise in your own eyes for the Lord. Fear the Lord and shun evil. The word shun means avoid deliberately. Avoid engaging in or participating in. Number two, run. 1 Corinthians 10 says that when we are tempted, God makes a way of escape, a door to get away. Find the door and hit it. Run. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife and she grabbed his garment and said, let's have sex today, he ran out of the house. He didn't stay around. So number one, shun. Number two, run. Number three, have fun. Shun, run, have fun. Learn how to have clean fun. Clean fun doesn't leave you with a hangover. Clean fun doesn't leave you pregnant out of wedlock. Clean fun doesn't land you in jail. So learn how to have clean fun. Everybody say amen. Number four, guard your heart. Find the entrances of impurity into your life, whether your ears, your eyes, wherever it's coming from, and guard it. Put a, put a wall there. Uh, get some kind of app that stops you from looking at stuff on the computer. Find a way to block the entrance. Number five, find someone you can be accountable to. Someone that will ask you the hard question. Not did you go to church today and did you sing well and did you stay after for prayer time, but how did you do last night when you were alone with your computer? Were you watching something you shouldn't have watched? Find somebody that'll ask you the truth. Number six, be vigilant and aggressive. You've got to fight for purity. It won't be easy. You've got to find positive energy. Your best defense is a good offense. When you go after God, when you follow him with all of your heart, when you're aggressive, you are putting the enemy in his place and you can win. Number seven, feed your spirit. 
Strengthen your inner man. Give your inner man the word of God. Give him God's presence. Give him God's word. Strengthen him against your flesh so you can win the battle that goes on inside of you. Number eight, worship consistently. Surround yourself with worship. Put worship music on in your room. Put worship music on on your earphones. Uh, Put worship music on wherever you are and let God's presence surround you. Number nine, witness to others. When Jesus gave the great commission to go to all the world and make disciples, he knew it was good for the church. Now the world needed Jesus, but the church needed to tell the world about Jesus. I wanna say to you in my own life, one of the great deterrents to sin and to impurity has been the fact that I know on a regular basis I talk to people about Jesus Christ. There is something in me that drives me to say, I want my testimony to back up my preaching, and I want what I say to have verification in my life, and I know I need the power of God when I talk to somebody else so they'll receive Jesus, and it helps purify me in my heart. Wow. Number 10, fall in love with a crucified Savior. His blood is your only hope. Be honest today. Don't be a Pharisee, be honest. The blood of Jesus has made a statement on the earth that purity is possible. Several years ago, Lisa and I had the opportunity to go to the Gettysburg battlefield. My son Ashley studied Gettysburg his whole life, so he was with us. He became our de facto tour guide. He knew things that the tour guides didn't know, and we walked around, and uh, We came to this one place, it's called the Angle on the Gettysburg Battlefield. It's on Cemetery Ridge. And it's the place where Pickett's Charge came to what they say is the high water mark of the Confederacy. In other words, it's the furthest the Confederacy got to almost having a victory. Pickett's men charged a thousand yards across a field under heavy artillery fire. They came to this one place and they broke through just a little bit at the angle. And the Union Army closed the gap, turned away the Confederacy, and from then on, the Confederacy was on defense. It was the high watermark. Listen closely. The high watermark for ungodliness, impurity, and demonic activity happened almost 2,000 years ago. It's not happening now. It happened almost 2,000 years ago in a city called Jerusalem. When every demonic power on earth gathered to stop Jesus Christ and his mission of redeeming mankind. And on the, on the cross of Calvary, Satan made his greatest charge. But that day, Jesus stayed there. He would not come down. And by the love of God and the submission to the will of God, he defeated Satan once and for all. Listen, listen, listen. Since that day... Since the shedding of the blood of Jesus and the power of the victory of the cross, Satan has not been at his high water mark. He's on the run, and you and I have the victory through the power of the blood of Jesus. <laughs> now, come on, Dr. Wilson, be real. Can you live pure? I'm, I'm going to say real to you. Not easy, but yes. But you've got to be aggressive. If you're passive, you're dead meat. you got to be aggressive and seek God and learn how to apply what Jesus did at the cross to your life. When the holy blood of Jesus hit this earth, it made a statement once and for all. Not only that our sins could be forgiven, but that the power of sin could be broken and that you and I could be made the righteousness of of God in Christ Jesus. Would you bow your head? Father, I thank you for your presence today and your grace. We all struggle, Lord. Whether it's impurity of greed or the impurity of bitterness or the impurity of lust. Everyone in this room is human. Because of that, we have the human struggle So Jesus, today we come to you and we say that outward conformity doesn't get us there. When we try that, we fail. License doesn't get us there either. We need supernatural help, Jesus.
from you and your presence in the cross. So I pray for this student body. I love them. I know, Lord, so many of them in this room want to desperately be pure. As I prayed for you and with you, Lord, in this sermon a couple of days ago, you know, Lord, I felt this burden in, that would be in this room this morning of desperation from a few hearts who are so desperate to find a way to purity. And I pray, Lord, that what happened to your servant David when he realized the impurity of his own heart that caused him to murder a man and take the man's wife, that he cried out, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O God, that that prayer would resound and ricochet in the hearts and lives of these students and that the despair they feel would be met by the power of the cross and that Satan would be repelled in their life. I pray now, Lord, you would minister your love and grace. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, if you're here and you say, Dr. Wilson, I really need supernatural help in my life in this area of purity, just raise your hand. No one's looking, just lift it up all over this room. I'm not even looking at individuals, but so many hands. I want to say to you, please listen closely. Run, run to the cross. Learn how to shun evil. Learn how to run away from the biggest temptations. And learn that God loves you. And he's ready. He's ready to wash you in his presence by his word. And most importantly, by the blood of his son. I love you today. God's going to help you as you seek him. I want everybody to stand, would you please? Come on, stand up. Everybody raise your hands. Raise your hands. You're going to say something after me. Okay, here we go. You ready? I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I want to be a follower of Jesus. And I want to live pure. So God, help me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me like you, Jesus. I give my life to you. I surrender to you. Do your work and refine me for your glory. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Go change the world. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college but not sure what to expect, then visit us today at oru.edu. Make no little plans here.